Close your eyes. Let's just pray one more time before we get going. Jesus, we're here for you. We're here because we love you and we want to know you more. Holy Spirit, tonight is your night. Let tonight be extraordinary. I thank you that not one person here will leave still broken. That every broken heart will be healed. Every broken body will be set free. My Father, every bondage will be broken. That every person here will leave filled with your spirit. Exploding with your power. And a desire, my Father, an absolute divine unction to tell their world that Jesus saves. For every person here that does not yet know you as their Savior, let them come face to face with you that they can never again deny that you are God. We are yours, Jesus. We are here to meet with you. Nothing else. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Hallelujah. Woo. Hallelujah. Did you enjoy this morning? Yeah. I was blessed myself out of my socks. Yeah. Well, this is so wonderful about Jesus. Even the preacher gets blessed. <laughs> he ministers to me while he is using me to minister to you. I am more in love with him than ever. And tonight... Tonight, we are just going to flow with him. Not that we didn't do this morning, but tonight, I want to spend a little bit more time on ministry. I want to lay hands on every person here. Whatever God wants to do in you, whatever he needs to do in you tonight, he is going to do. Amen. Tonight is going to be a night of encounters. <laughs> encounters with the Holy Spirit. He is so eager. He is so desiring to change you. So you can be a vessel, an even more surrendered vessel in his hands. There are enough people here to get the whole of Bristol saved. Enough, there are actually enough people here to get the whole of the UK saved. If we really put shoulder to plow and we do the job. But we have to be surrendered, wholly surrendered, not fearing man at all, but only fearing our God. And that fear is born out of love. I want to kick off with the scripture that the Lord has laid so heavily on my heart. You know, I love, I love flying. I love long plane trips because it's just, it's just me and God. And I get to spend so much time with him. And he speaks to my heart. And I speak to him. And it is just a fantastic time. And on my plane right here, the Lord put John 14, John 14, 23, so heavily on my heart. And as I read it, he spoke to me through it. And I, I was shaken. And I want to read this verse to you. And we are going to kick off with it tonight. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. I've probably read that verse Hundreds of times before. But what I love about scripture is you can read a verse so many times and then you just read it one more time and it hops off the page in a different way. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Tamron, I live in every believer. I said, yes, Lord, I know. That's what I preach. <laughs> of course you live in every believer. Why are you telling me something I already know? I preach so people can accept you as their Savior, so you can come and live in them. He said, Tamron, let me finish. Okay, Lord, okay. He said, I live in every believer, but I do not feel at home in every believer. I do not feel at home in every believer. I said, what? 
what do you mean you do not feel at home and every believer and I started to to think about this concept and I started to understand what the Lord was saying to me my friend you feel at home with people who share your heartbeat you feel at home with people whose whose priorities mimic your priorities, whose focus mimics your focus. You feel at home with people whose hearts beat at one with your heart. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the heartbeat of God? If he is to feel truly at home in us, what do our lives have to look like? And my friend, there is one thing that is on the very top of God's priority list. There is one thing that is the number one on his to-do list. And that is the salvation of every man and every woman. That is the salvation of souls. That is, gosh, if he could sleep, that is what would keep him awake at night. And I was, I was filled with sorrow there on that plane. I said, God, God, I need you to feel at home in me. I am an evangelist. Winning souls is what I do. But I don't think it's ever enough. I don't think it's ever enough for him. He weeps over the lost. I can imagine God weeping over the lost. When he called me to be a crusade evangelist and gave me Africa as the focus of the ministry I had up in his name ministries, I heard his cry. It was the same cry that evangelist Reinhard Bonker speaks about hearing that cry, Africa shall be saved. But my friends, when I heard it, it sounded as if God was weeping. It shook me. It sounded as if God was crying with such an urgency, with such a desperation, as if Africa was slipping through his fingers and he was struggling to grab hold of her. I heard it, Africa, Africa will be saved. And there are people here, what I heard about Africa, you are going to hear about the UK. You are going to hear about Bristol. Tonight in this meeting, God is going to speak to you. You are going to hear it about your community, about your city. Some of you are going to hear it about other nations. God is going to send people here to other nations, to other cities, and you will hear that heart cry. And you have to surrender all. You have to say, God, let your heartbeat become my heartbeat. I want you to feel fully at home in me. What is your priority? I make it mine. What do you want? What you want? Let it be the only thing that I want. It is when we lay our will down and we say, God, let your will be done. That is when... That is when he can truly use us. But that is the most difficult thing to do. That, laying your will down and picking up his will, that was the one thing that even Jesus sweat tears of blood over. In the Garden of Gethsemane, that was the one time we saw Jesus wrestle with the will of God. That was the one time in which the will of Jesus and the will of God was not automatically in line. Jesus needed to wrestle his will in line with the will of God. And tonight, some of you are going to go through that. You are going to wrestle your will into the will of God and say, God, forgive me. I want nothing if you do not want it. The dreams I have had for my own life, I lay them down. I lay them down. If you want to resurrect them, God, you resurrect them. But I lay them down. And only what you want for my life, that, let that thing resurrect itself. Or let that thing be born. These might be hard words, my friend, but we have to hear them. We have to hear them. God is God. And he wants to use us. But his will needs to reign supreme. 
I want to turn over a couple of verses in John to John 21. And I want to read you a portion of scripture that we know is the restoration of Peter. But I don't agree with that title. I will tell you why. Let's read it together. Then I will, I will tell you what the Lord has laid on my heart regarding it. John 21 from verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now, my friend, if you study this passage in the original Greek, truths drop down from heaven. I said this morning that I studied law straight out of school. And while I was studying law, I attended a few Bible classes at my church. And there was a lecturer there. He had his doctorate in in the original ancient languages. And I fell in love with this idea of unpacking the word of God, how it was originally written. So I started studying the biblical Greek. It made my law studies feel like ash. A dry, dead thing. But I started studying the biblical Greek and I fell in love with it. And my friend, I want to pull out of this passage what I believe is such a pivotal truth. I have heard many fantastic messages on this passage. But I want to share with you what the Lord laid on my heart regarding this passage. It stirred me. It shook me. And I know it is going to do the same for you tonight. I preached this morning about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I am going to bring that back into my message tonight because I do not believe there is anything more pivotal that we as believers need to understand the power of. There are believers all over the world filled with the Holy Spirit that are not doing the will of God, that are not being used by God to win the lost. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, my friend, It is the power of God in the believer. And if we understand its power and we truly surrender to it, there is nothing God cannot use you to accomplish. Hallelujah! In the Greek, there are different words for love. Different words. There is a word for erotic, sensual love. There are words for brotherly love. And then there is the word that we know so well, agape, agapeo, the God kind of love. This this unconditional, holy surrendered love, the love that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13, the love that conquers all, the love that suffers, the love that withstands, the love that prevails, the love that kept Jesus on the cross, the love that compelled God to send his son into this world, that love, that love, agape, agapeo love. And when Jesus addressed Peter, He used that word. He said, Peter, do you agapeo me? Will you suffer? Will you give it all up? Will you surrender all? Will you do everything that I instruct you to do? Do you love me so much that you will lay down your life for me? 
Do you love me enough to be wholly surrendered, to hold nothing back, to eat, breathe, eat, dream, sleep, nothing but me? And Peter is very honest. When he responds, when he says, Lord, you know I love you, he does not use agapeo. He uses a different word, phileo. What is phileo? Brotherly love. It's, it's like Jesus says, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know, I like you very much. <laughs> but I respect Peter. We must remember what Peter has just gone through. Peter was so convinced that he loved Jesus with everything. So convinced. He declared that Jesus, I am ready to die for you. I will die with you. But then when the testing came, when a handmaiden, a servant girl asked Peter, do you know who that man is? Peter rejected. He denied his Jesus. He denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times when Jesus was, had been arrested, when Jesus was standing trial and people asked him, do you know him? Do you know him? Peter said, I don't, I don't. And then he swore and said, I don't know him. This Peter, he, he had just come to the understanding that he did not love Jesus as much as he thought. Did Peter, did Peter doubt who Jesus was? No. It was Peter when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say I am? It was Peter who stepped forward and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned to him and said, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. God the Father has given you this revelation. You know who I am. Peter knew who Jesus was. He was fully convinced but when, when the trial came, fear overcame him. Fear, fear of a man overcame Peter. And he rejected his God. He rejected him not once, not twice, but three times he rejected him. So Peter, I love Peter. Peter understood. He had come to the end of himself. He understood he was not as fantastic as he thought he was. He did not love his Jesus like he thought he did. And so when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me enough to lay it all down? Peter said, Jesus, I don't know. I don't know. And Jesus asks Peter again. Do you agapeo me? Do you love me enough to suffer whatever I need you to suffer in my name? Do you love me enough so that next time someone asks you, who do you, Peter, say that Jesus the Christ is? Do you love me enough to stand strong and say, I know who he is. He is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. Accept him and be saved. Reject him and be condemned. Peter, Jesus said, do you agapeo me? And Peter again, Lord, I don't know. Lord, I want to, I want to, I want to, but I have just failed. I don't know if I have the strength to agapeo you, Jesus, but I know I like you very much. I want to, I want to love you, to lay everything down. I want to love you that much, but I don't know if I can. And Jesus relents. And the last time he asks Peter, do you love me? He does not use the word agapeo. He says, Peter, do you like me very much? And Peter, the Bible says, is grieved. He is grieved and he breaks down and he says, yes, Lord, I like you very much. But why is the story so fantastic? Why? The heading there is the restoration of Peter. For me, the restoration of Peter was not complete until Acts chapter 2. 
We read it this morning, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Something happened to Peter when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Something happened to this man. This man who could not say to Jesus, Jesus, I agapeo you. Jesus, I will suffer for you. I will bleed for you. I lay my will down. Nothing will make me reject you again. I love you without condition. I love you without motive. I love you because I love you. Something happened to Peter. When Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, my friend, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, something happened in him. All of a sudden, the strength came. All of a sudden, he got the ability to lay his own will down, to lay his life down and say, Jesus, I will suffer. I will die. I give it all. I love you because I love you. I agape you. How do we know how do we know that? Because it was Peter, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we read it this morning, Acts chapter 2, after the disciples were baptized with the Spirit, it was Peter who went in front of crowd, a crowd of thousands in Jerusalem, the very city where Jesus had been put to death. There must have been Roman soldiers in that crowd. There must have been Pharisees in that crowd. It was Peter who stepped out in front of that crowd and he no longer just liked Jesus very much. He was ready to die for him. And he preached to thousands. The same Jesus who had re- the same Peter who had rejected Jesus when a girl, when a young servant girl said, Do you know who he is? And Peter said, No, I don't. The same Peter stood in front of thousands and preached a kind of message that every evangelist would be proud to preach. You know, evangelists tend to be straight like arrows. We would make horrible politicians. We don't go a bit this way. We don't go a bit that way. We tell it to you straight. This was the kind of message that Peter preached. Believe on Jesus. Believe on him and be saved. He is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. And the Bible says, that there was an absolute flood tide of salvation that day. Peter, Peter was completely transformed by this Holy Spirit baptism experience. My friend tonight, you might sit here and you might say, Tamron, I want to agape your God. I want to love him so much. That when I get the opportunity to speak about him, I no longer hold back. I want to love him so much that when I'm given the opportunity, no fear of man, no fear of condemnation holds me back. No fear of rejection holds me back. But I speak. My friend, you are going to come face to face with the Holy Spirit. If you are not yet baptized with him, you are going to get baptized. If you are already baptized and you say to me, Tamron, I still fear man. My friend, it is an illusion. It is a deception. It is like a shadow. The devil is manipulating you because he is petrified of the kind of believer you will become if you really understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit. But tonight... God is going to remind you. He is going to show you what it means to be filled with the Spirit. I spoke this morning about a saturation. How when you are filled with the Spirit, you become saturated with God. And I believe that includes a a complete transformation of your heart. A complete transformation of your heart. John, John's heart was transformed. John John was such a judgmental character. I always chuckle when I hear the story about John and his brother when a certain village rejected Jesus. And John and his brother say, oh, Jesus, can we call fire down from heaven and burn them up? That is not very nice at all. That is is horrible. That is actually beyond mean. That is just plain vindictive. And I always chuckle to myself when I read that because it is John who wrote those words, God is love. 
And if you do not love your brother, you cannot love God. John, the same man who wanted to burn up the sinners with vengeance, was the same man who got such a revelation of the love of God that he wrote and he said, if you do not love, you do not love God. If you do not love those out there, men and women dying in their sins, and your fellow believers, if you do not love, you do not love God. What happened to John? The same thing that happened to Peter. The same thing. They were both in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They were both filled with the Spirit. And that Holy Spirit saturation transformed them completely. Completely. The fear of man went out the window. That self-righteousness of John went out the window. And they became vessels that God could use for his glory. Surrendered, surrendered, surrendered. One finds in the kingdom of God, if there is any doctrine that the devil fights, it is the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There are so many denominations, they do not even believe in it. The devil fights this doctrine because he knows it is believers who are filled with the Spirit. Those believers, those believers will take him out. Those believers. Yes, when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are on our way to heaven. But it's the believers who have been filled with the Spirit. It is those believers who shake the kingdom of darkness and destroy it. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, my friend. This baptism, it does not just bring power. It does not just change our hearts. But it brings incredible intimacy with God. I want to hop over to the Old Testament and read from, from Numbers chapter 12. I, I discovered this the other day. And it is absolutely fantastic. Numbers chapter 12 from verse 1. Let's read together quickly. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, has the Lord Indeed, spoken only through Moses. Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. They were in trouble, those two. And they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly and not in dark sayings. And he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? What do I want to highlight here? This, this passage stirs me and I will tell you why. Moses could not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the blood of Jesus had not yet come. The Holy Spirit can only fill somebody who has been washed clean by the blood of Jesus because the Holy Spirit is holy. He can only saturate someone who has been, de been declared the righteousness of God. So Moses could not be baptized with the Holy Spirit. God still needed to keep a little bit at a distance. Now, when we think about Moses, we think about someone who we aspire to be like. 
Oh, if I could just serve God like Moses. If I could just have intimacy with God like Moses had. That is how we speak, is it not? He is one of the greats. He, he is one of those people who we want our lives to be like. Back in the day, maybe the teenagers had rock star posters of Moses up on their bedroom walls. He was someone people wanted to be like, Moses, Moses, Moses. But when I read this passage recently, the Lord dropped something into my heart and it was fantastic. Here in verses 6, 7, and 8, when the Lord speaks, it is like he is rating different levels of relationship with him. And he starts at the lowest level. And he speaks about the prophet. Those who he speaks to in visions and dreams. Those are at the lowest level. Then he moves a level up and he says, but then there is Moses. I speak to him face to face. My friend, let me tell you something. We are at the next level. We are at the next level. God no longer stands outside of us speaking to us. God is in us. God is in us. And if you have been baptized with his spirit, then he is in all of you. You have been saturated with him. God does not speak to you face to face. He speaks to you spirit to spirit. This, this got me so excited. This got me so excited that Moses looks at us and he says, God, oh, if I could only have been as intimate with you as they are. Moses looks at us and says, oh, God, if I could only have lived today in 2017, you and I would have been so much closer. You would not have been restricted to speaking to me face to face. You could have spoken to me spirit to spirit. Oh, Lord, what I could have done for you if you were so close to me as these people are today. This is a revelation, my friend. This shook me. This shook me. That rather than us looking at Moses and saying, we want the relationship Moses had, Moses looks at us and says, wow. Wow. God, you actually... You actually are inside of them. And not just inside of them, but you saturate them. They drip with you. They are full of you. This, this my friend, is who we are. Who we are. There's a level of intimacy. There's a level of intimacy. But the devil is so clever. He deceives us. He discourages us. He, he makes us think that we cannot get to this. He makes us think that our relationship with God could never get to the level that we yearn for. My friend, let me tell you something. You can get as close to God as what you want. He is in you. If you've been filled with the Spirit, He has saturated you. Stop ignoring him. Stop pulling away from him. Push into him. He is there. He is there. Spirit to spirit. Perfect, non-stop, 24-7 communion. You can feel his presence every moment of every day. Every moment of every day. And why? Why does God want to be this intimate with us? Firstly, because he absolutely adores you and he cannot bear to be one second away from you. That is the first reason. That is the first reason. But the second reason is so he can flow through you to touch others. That is the second reason. And that second reason is so intimately connected with the first. Because my friend... If your heart beats with his heartbeat, you, you will not be able to help yourself. You will always have others in mind. You will always be thinking, does that one know him? Does that one know what he did for them on the cross? Has that one had an encounter with him? This is where your heart will go. This is where your heart will go. 
But we can be so selfish. We can be so self-centered, worried about our own little lives, our own little problems, while the world is going to hell. And God is weeping within us, saying, I am in you. I have saturated you. I am more intimate with you than I was with Moses. Help me. Help me win the lost. Help me win those who I might lose for an eternity. What are we waiting for, my friend? What are we waiting for? Go for it. Go, leave this place in the knowledge that God is in you and he needs you. He needs you. God needs us. He needs us. I wish he had ordained the angels to preach to the lost. Because if Gabriel pitches up in a pub in front of a bunch of sinners and says, Believe in Jesus, they will say, yes, sir. (laughs) Put down the beer. We are in church tomorrow morning. It will be highly effective. But God did not choose that method. And God must not have chosen it because it isn't actually the most effective method. We are because God chose us. It doesn't make sense because on the surface we do not look like the perfect choice. But we must be. Otherwise, God wouldn't have chosen us. We must be. He loves people too much. He wants everybody in hell, in, in, he wants everybody to escape hell too much. He must have chosen the perfect method. You and I are the perfect method. Born again believers, filled with his spirit, intimate with him. Our heartbeat, our heartbeat imitating his heartbeat out there telling the world that Jesus saves. Amen? Are you ready? Are you ready to kick the devil? Are you ready to petrify him? Are you ready to torment the tormentor? Good, because you are going to do it and you will not recognize yourself. You will no longer be a creeping, crawling Christian. You will be a hell-smashing, fire-breathing, bondage-breaking, wall-crushing, devil-destroying Christian. As God ordained you to be at one with him, hearing his whisper, hearing his heart. Laying your life down and loving him like he deserves to be loved. Agapeo love. Wholly surrendered. Laying it all down. Doing whatever he wants you to do. Because you cannot help yourself. You love him that much. This is possible, my friend. It is possible to live this way. Let us stand up together. Let us stand up together. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, forgive us. Before I start praying for people, I have to ask. There are people here You say to me, Tamron, you are speaking about loving Jesus. I do not even know him as my savior yet. How do you know that he is your savior? You know, my friend, because you have asked him to be that. We all need Jesus. Why? We need him because our sin separates us from God. This has got nothing to do with God's love for us. It has to do with his supreme holiness. And our sin cannot come into the presence of that holiness. And because of that, sin separates us from God here on earth. Even though he wants to come and live within us, even though he wants to be so intimate with us, he cannot because our sin pushes him out. When we die, even though he wants us in heaven, we cannot get into heaven because our sin pushes us out of his presence and we end up in hell. But this is not what God wants. 
I spoke about the blood of Jesus washing people clean. That is what you need. That is what you need. You need to ask Jesus to wash you clean with his precious blood. And if you ask him, he will do it and you will become his. And you will become intimate with the one who created you. And nothing will ever pull you out of his hands. If that is you, if you say, Tamron, I want to ask Jesus to be my savior. I want you to lift up your hands so I can see who you are because I want to pray with you. Give me a wave. God bless you, sir. Give me a wave if that is you. Give me a wave if that is you. You might be here. You say, Tamron, I have run away from God. I have run away from him. My life is not right. I am doing things that I know I should not do. But tonight, I want to run back into his arms. I want to run back. I want to recommit my life to you. If that is you, give me a wave. If that is you, give me a wave. Anybody, 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 anybody. Come to the front, sir. Come. We are going to pray with you. Anybody else? You out there, just, just touch your neighbor on the shoulder. Stand here for me, stand here for me. Touch your neighbor on the shoulder. You out there. And say, neighbor, is Jesus in your heart? Come check, even if they are the pastor, just check. Is Jesus in your heart? If your neighbor says, yes, yes, I am sure. Say, oh, wonderful, God bless you. But if your neighbor, no, wait, wait, don't, don't go, don't go. Come back, come back, come back, come back. Just stand here for me, just stand here for me. If your neighbor is not sure, say, neighbor, I will come with you to the front. Check with your neighbor, please check with him, check with him. Are we all saved here? Give me a wave if you are saved and you are sure. I'm going to check because if you're not waving, I will come and fetch you. So you better wave. I have done it before. I have done it before. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. We are going to pray. Pray this prayer together with this gentleman, okay? Sir, you repeat these words after me, okay? Okay. Let's say, dear Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Come and live in my heart. Wash away my sin with your blood. Thank you, Jesus. I believe in you. I now belong to you. You are my God. And I am your child. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Amen. The worship team can come join me or just someone on the keyboard, please. I've been so blessed by your worship. I have really been abundantly blessed. We are going to pray for people now. Before we start praying, my book, we still have copies available at the back, five pounds. We make it as cheap as possible. This book speaks about how you can be used by God. It teaches on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It teaches on the gifts. It teaches how God wants to partner with you to get your world saved. It will empower you. What I have written in here, I did not learn in Bible school. I learned on the crusade field, hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, coming against every demon of hell. And I'm still here, okay? So guess who won? This will bless you. Get it. Get it if you can at all. Get it. Connect with the ministry. Our website is inhisname.global. Okay, we have a free booklet you can download. One that I've just written called Make God Marvel. It is about faith. <coughs> it will bless you. And find me on Facebook, okay? I love Facebook. I think social media is a gift straight down from heaven. Find me, we can connect and we can stay in touch, okay? But now, I want to pray for you here. Let's raise our hands to heaven. 
Raise your hands to heaven.